let's break down this train scene from RRR. This part is a fully CG train. This part was shot using miniature models at 1 8 the scale. And this part used a full-size train replica. Action. Action scenes on trains involve a lot of moving parts, literally. Filmmakers have to create the illusion of a constantly shifting environment combined with various stunts, camera work, and special effects. But sometimes they also use the real thing, which comes with risks of its own. Shooting a real train crash like this one in 1927 as the general can earn you a place in cinematic history. At an estimated price of $42,000 in 1927, equivalent to over $700,000 today, this is the most expensive shot in silent film history. But the train's engine caused numerous forest fires. Lawrence of Arabia also derailed a real train for this scene, placing the camera far enough away from the action to avoid the crash. In the perfect world, you would have full-size trains exploding and tumbling over, but practically that's tons and tons of metal. It paid off in 2012 Skyfall, but the amount of setup required meant they really only had one chance to get it right. Redoing it could have meant months of extra work. So many filmmakers opt for a safer solution that gives them more control over the action, miniatures, which along with special effects create the illusion of a full-size train. The next best thing is to scale it down to a, a size that is practical. And so you want to have a base that's practical, and then you can add CG on top of that. It's this perfect mix of practical and visual effects that makes for the best crashes. When it came to the crash in RRR, the technique depended on the shot. The wide shots were miniatures, so they could do as many takes as needed. The crew used eight interchangeable cars. Each was made out of metal, aluminum, and cast iron. That way, they could blow up but remain intact enough to be reused. Everything is then painted with different types of paint that can take all the heat from the fire, but still behave as it would like in a full-size scenario. Like any full-size train, the miniature needed the correct movements to sell the scene. It was pulled forward by wire and small ramps were welded into the tracks for a bumpier ride. It made this kind of small jump as the explosion went off. The piece of bridge the train crashes through was built with breakaway material that could easily be reset post-crash while blending in with the rest of the set. As for the actual explosion, as one crew member pulled the train forward, another had to detonate it at the exact right moment. There was no other way of doing that sync other than just time it. <laughs> On set, this all happens incredibly fast, but that's not necessarily a good thing. If you film them in the same shooting speed as you would for like a full-size train, everything is going to look like a toy because everything is moving too fast. So the miniature crash was filmed at 96 frames per second. This high frame rate slowed the action down. If you look at it through the 96 frames per second, basically in slow motion, you get something that is way closer to what you would see if you saw that thing happen in front of you in real size. Since the miniatures weren't detailed enough, the close-up shots of the train switch to a fully CG locomotive. And when the train collapses, the scene switches to a full-size car mounted to a flipper. It was crucial that it tumbled and flipped in the same direction each time to keep the child in the shot safe. To achieve the correct sense of scale, the miniature was shot separately, like here when the train hangs over the bridge before it collapses. To line up the full size and miniature action, Daniel and the crew placed a cardboard cutout of the boy right in front of the camera. The crew also had to make sure they replicated the camera movement for consistent action. There was a subtle rotational camera movement on him, and the miniature was all shot statically. First, they filmed the miniature set using two cameras pointed in two different directions. Those frames were then projected onto a miniature 3D model of the bridge. This allowed the VFX team to replicate the camera movement of both the shot of the actor and the shot of the miniature. There was a miniature shot projected onto 3D geometry in order to get the camera movement. Typically, there's just as much action inside the train as there is outside, like the multitude of fight scenes that take place inside a high-speed train in 2022's Bullet Train. Just as important as well-rehearsed fight choreography is a flexible set built on a soundstage. Bullet Train used multiple custom-built train cars with removable walls, allowing the cameras to follow the action. Smaller parts like the seats could also be moved around to accommodate the cast and cameras during fight scenes. Even when the action takes place inside the train, you still have to create the illusion of continuous movement. 
for bullet train, this car was attached to a pulley system. As it moved forward, the legs released air pressure against the floor. While bullet trains travel smoothly, other trains experience constant turbulence and bumps. Tell everyone to hang on. That can be achieved by putting the train car set on a gimbal. You can see it creating some realistic rocking as Spider-Man and Dr. Octopus face off in Spider-Man 2, and creating the vibrating and sideways movements in Snowpiercer. But the set doesn't always need to move. We had different solutions for, for every shot. Take these quick shots in RRR. The set was completely static. The sudden violent halt you see is thanks to a camera move. When you combine some camera shake with those guys rocking back and forth, you're selling the idea of having that rocky motion. Another key ingredient to fake movement, lighting. These two spinning structures replicated the shadows that the bridge would cast on the train. Bullet Train took it another step forward with these LED screens just outside the train's windows. The screens contained real footage shot in Japan that provided both the moving scenery and accurate reflections. However, all this footage was shot from either drones or camera vehicles, which could only travel at around 60 miles per hour or else the footage would appear unstable. At its peak, the train reaches 186 miles per hour, meaning the footage had to be sped up or looped. Often the action moves from inside to the top or side of a train. With great care, these types of shots can be filmed on a real moving train, like in Skyfall. But the realism comes with limitations. Because of the speed, all the camera equipment had to be locked down, as did the actors. But as Mission Impossible showed, it is possible to fake the exterior conditions without losing any of the thrill. For the shots where Tom Cruise clings to the roof of a high-speed train, the crew employed a fan capable of blasting 140 mile per hour gusts at the actor creating the convincing look of hair and cloth flapping in the wind. Unlike with those RRR miniature shots, the crew needed to add more speed. One way they did this was through undercranking, in which the action is shot at a lower frame rate so it can be sped up after. And just like those bullet train interiors, the exterior shots were framed by real footage shot by the crew to replace the blue screen backdrop. But while undercranking worked for the train, it would make any moving background objects look wonky. That meant all the cars and tractors in the background had to be digitally removed one by one. Many filmmakers have found out that you can shoot thrilling train action with no train at all. For example, when Brad Pitt's character flies through the exploding bullet train, the actor was lifted up by a spinning tuning fork to replicate flying through the air, with CG destruction and debris added in later. While this train shot from RRR was shot on real tracks, there's no train at all, but instead a small cart on a track which the actors could safely run along. That car was swapped out with a CG train with some slight adjustments to the action. The train was a little bit wider than expected. We pushed Ram a little bit out to the side in order to get the framing nice. It was just for practical reasons, otherwise he would be hit by the train as it came through. But that shot was still vital. They also had something to interact with because the timing and everything was based on that car movement. So I think it's important to get your hands dirty and make something practical and unpredictable once in a while. One technique ne doesn't necessarily make the other one obsolete. I think they can work together. 